Good morning, everybody. Um, you're very welcome this morning to the service, either in the church or if you're watching later on online. Um, I guess I should start off by saying you've probably already realized that but from this morning we've moved back to our original time. So you had 10 minutes extra to uh, relax and reflect this morning. Uh, so from th this Sunday forward, we'll be back to 10.40 a.m. Uh, to give the Sunday school more time, amongst other things. Also, there's an opportunity to contribute to the poppy appeal, either at the back of the church or in the front on the way out. Um, as we gradually try to move back to the no new normal, there are a small number of changes in respect of our COVID arrangements. Going forward, we're going to ask you to leave church in turn, maintaining social distancing at all times. However, you're not going to have to wait until a marshal shows you out, so we think you're all clever enough to work this out for yourselves. So as you're heading out, uh, if you can leave a distance, stand back if necessary, but basically uh, try and take it in turn without all rushing, but it should speed up the movement out of the church. Also, when you're sitting, if you feel comfortable, you can remove your mask when seated, but if you stand or start to sing, you must put your mask back on. So it's entirely up to you. If you feel comfortable, the mask can be taken, taken off while sitting. Um, Cameo lunch will be held this Thursday, the 18th of November at 12.30, and everybody is very welcome to come along for a light lunch and a chat. Next Sunday, DV, we will celebrate communion, and as before, we'll use individual uh, element sets that will be in the pews for you. We have had quite a few announcements over the last few weeks. Just wanted to remind you that we still can't give you printed notices, but please note that all the announcements are actually on the website under news and events, and that's lowernendspc.org. And finally, but not least, we're very pleased to welcome back the Reverend Ivan Leash to our pulpit this morning, and we look forward to hearing what he has to say for us. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's nice to be back with you here in Lone Ends for this occasion when we meet together to worship God, but also to remember those who gave their lives in so many different conflicts and to give thanks for the heritage that we've received because of their sacrifice. Let me read to you from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews essentially helps to explain and to bring into the New Testament covenant, if you like, many of the things that were part of Old Testament worship. And it always points us to Jesus Christ. So let me read from Hebrews 12 and the first verse. The writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So with that encouragement and exhortation, we come to worship God together, and we're going to sing, O God, our help in ages past.
let's pray together. O Lord, our God, we bow in your presence this morning. We come together to exalt you. We come to lift you up in our praise and in our hearts. We meet so that we might glorify you and sing your praise that we might declare again your greatness and your majesty. We come to affirm that we belong to you, that we are your people, your children, that you are our Father. We come to you as the one who has created everything that exists in the midst of this universe with all of its mystery. We come to declare that you have brought everything into being. We come to you as the one who has created us in your image and likeness. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us separate and different and distinct from all of the other forms of life in our world, that you have put your stamp upon us, that you have made us in your image and your likeness, that you have created us to know you, and to live life in fellowship with you. And Lord, we recognize that we by nature have, as your word tells us, turned to our own way. We have each gone our own separate path. But we rejoice again that you have reached out to us and in mercy you've sent your beloved son. We praise you that he came to rescue us to bring us back to you, to redeem us and buy us and bring us your forgiveness and your salvation. And Lord, we thank you that when we are joined to him by faith, then we are promised that you do not number our sins against us, but you cast them away from you. You forget them and you remember them no more. And Lord, we praise you that you give us your Holy Spirit, that he brings the Savior to us and gives us a desire for you and a longing to, to follow you and to bring honor to you in our lives. So Lord, we meet together today to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray that you'll help us to do that. And as we later in the service remember those who in many different conflicts and especially in two world wars gave their lives for us we thank you lord that because of that we are free to worship you today in this way way and we can gather and none can hinder us and so lord we pray that you will grant us afresh your grace that you will give us hearts that seek after you in the promise that when we do so, we will find you. And when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So Lord, will you bless us? Will you re revive us and renew us and refresh us? Will you prepare us for the week that lies ahead, that we might go to wherever you've placed us and live out the gospel and live in a way that we reflect the one to whom we belong. So hear our prayer, we pray, and we ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Going to uh, read from Exodus chapter 3. Uh, the first occasion I was with you here in Lone Ends, we had a, what I call a bird's eye view of the book of Genesis. And uh, I think it's good sometimes to do that, to uh, take one look at a particular book of the Bible and look at what it says and what it teaches us. And I want to do that this morning with the book of Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament. So we're just uh, having uh, a, a one, one view uh, of, of the book of Exodus, trying to understand the message of this book. And it's interesting that we just sang about how God does not change over the ages, that he is the same uh, forever. And I trust we'll be able to see that as we look at the book of 
Exodus. So I'm going to read from chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Amen. We give thanks to God for his word. Now, in a moment, we're going to have our act of remembrance, and let me just explain to you Uh, what will be happening. Uh, First of all, there will be a laying of wreath. And then after that, I will say, Binion's Ode to the Fallen. Following the Ode to the Fallen, we will hear the last post. Then we will have a time of silence. And that silence will be broken by Ravali. And then after Ravali, I shall just say something very brief and then we'll pray together. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to follow that. And uh, let me ask you then to stand, please. Have a prayer. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
when you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we give our today. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to thank you for all that we have today, for everything that was bequeathed to us by the generations that have gone. We thank you for those who have been willing with courage and determination and resolve to go and face the enemy in two great world wars and in other conflicts and in our province. We thank you that they were not willing to bow down before evil intent, but they stood resolved to give all that they had so that good might prevail. And Lord, we thank you for those who made the ultimate sacrifice, who left these shores and other shores never to return. We thank you, Lord, for all that they have made possible for us. We thank you for their sacrifice, for their willingness to go and not to count their lives dear. And Lord, we pray that we in our day and generation will equally treasure all that they have ensured for us. And we pray that we will hold on to those values that caused them to go and that we will uphold that which is good and just. So Lord, accept our thanks and we offer our prayer through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. not having a second item of praise uh, due to the act of remembrance, so I um, just want to turn to God's word uh, for these moments. Um, a number of years ago, I conducted a, a funeral service in Abbott's Cross, where I was a minister, and we were having refreshments with the family afterwards, and while we were having refreshments, uh, a lady came and sat beside me, and she turned me in to me, and she just asked me this question. She said, I was wondering if you'd remember me. I looked at her, and I said, mm, give me a clue. I said, were we at school together? She said, well, 40 years ago, yes, she said, but a little bit more than that. And I stood and I, I sat and studied her. And I could not, there was nothing about her that said that I should know who she was. Well, you can imagine how shocked I was when it turned out that we had gone out together for two and a half years in our early 20s. Now, I dug a deeper hole for myself by trying to explain why I didn't recognize her. And I said to her, and my daughters were horrified that I said this to her, and I, of course I should never have said it. I said, have you put a little bit of weight on? Now, you will know that you simply don't say, I was just so flummoxed as to why I did not recognize this lady. She had changed. And it wasn't that years, the years had been unkind to her, but there was nothing that I recognized about her. Sometimes, I wonder if you ever feel like that about God. When you read the Old Testament and you say to yourself, this is a different God in the Old Testament from the God that we see in the New Testament. God must have changed. He's not the same. What we see in the books of Genesis and Exodus and all those other books and what we see in Jesus Christ is completely different. God must have evolved in some way. He has become different. Well, I want to stress to you that that is, of course, not the case. And the Bible is revealing to us the God who is the same yesterday, today, and 
forever. What God was when he created this universe, when he sent the prophets, what he was in Jesus Christ and what he is today is exactly the same and he will be to the end. This book that we read from, from start to finish, is a revelation of the one God, unchanging. And we'll see that as, as we look at how he deals with Abraham and Moses and David. The qualities that are there are to the fore in the New Testament, but they're presented in the Old Testament, and it's good to be reminded of that. So we just want to have a, a little bird's eye view, one look at the book of Exodus and see how God is the same there as the Father who deals with us and to whom we belong. Let me remind you of, of what precedes the book of Exodus. At the end of Genesis, God's people are essentially a, a, a family, the family of Jacob, and they're in Egypt. And <clears throat> when we come into Exodus, the next generation has come. The people have multiplied. The land is filled with them. There's a new king. He doesn't remember anything about uh, Joseph or Jacob or his family. He feels threatened and he decides that he's going to make them slaves and he oppresses them. But they continue to increase in number. And he decides this is, has to stop. And he says all the male children have to be drowned after they're born. And then we're told that their misery does not go unnoticed. And I read from uh, Exodus chapter 3 and it says God hears their cry. He's concerned about them and he responds to them. And that's where Moses enters the picture. And in the book of, of Exodus, Moses is the main human figure. And we believe that Moses penned the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, he's the second longest attributed person, if you like, in the book of Hebrew, Hebrews. He gets the second most space in the book of Hebrews. But let me just stress that this book is not about Moses. It is about the God to whom Moses belonged. So, I want to suggest to you that this book tells us uh, three things <coughs> about, about God. It describes God in three ways. First of all, he's the God who liberates. Uh, the title of the book means exit or departure. And it gets its name from the main event. And remember, this is the Old Testament church we're looking at in the book of Exodus. It's a familiar story. And I won't go into all the details, but you know how God determines to set the people free, liberate them from their bondage, and he sends Moses. Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house. Remember, he's taken out of the water, grows up in Pharaoh's house, stays there for 40 years, and then he goes out to see his people and he commits murder, realizes that he's been seen, and he runs away. He goes to the, into the desert and he marries Zipporah. And he stays there for 40 more years. And at the end of 80 years, so Moses is 80, God gets his attention in the burning bush and says, Moses, you are the one that I have chosen to go back to Pharaoh and tell him that he's to set my people free. He's to let them go so that they can worship me. And then, of course, Moses makes all sorts of excuses. In the end, he, he goes and does what God says. And we know, we know how it all pans out. Uh, Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. Uh, God sends the plagues. Pharaoh plays games saying, okay, that's all right. Get the plague to stop and I'll let you go and then changes his mind. And then they had that one terrible, terrible night that was going to be celebrated every year thereafter by these people called the Passover, where death would come to every Egyptian home. And after that, the people of Israel were allowed to leave the land of Egypt forever. The sea opened up, they crossed over, and so begins a new phase for the liberated people of God. They were to spend 40 years in the desert. God provides for them, gives them birds and bread to eat, gives them water to drink, even brings water out of a rock. He ensures that they have all that they need for their journey. God is still the same today. God still delivers thousands of years later. He liberates us today, not in the physical sense that he liberated the people from Egypt, but he liberates us from slavery to sin and death, doesn't he? You see, the important thing is that this was never just about geography. 
It wasn't just about getting the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. It was always about their hearts. Always. We'll see that in a moment or two. The purpose of Exodus, God said, was to bring freedom to the people so they could worship him. So it was a spiritual intent that God had, even though he had to bring the people physically out of of the land. (laughs) And so it is for us. God brings us from one place to another, doesn't he, when we come to him in faith. He brings us from darkness into light. He takes us from condemnation and brings us to forgiveness and accept. Our exodus is when he transfers us from death into life and brings us into his kingdom and his family so that he becomes our father. He provides for us for our journey, doesn't he? He gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us his word and his people and he directs our path. Centuries ago, it was the Passover that made that possible. In the New Testament, Jesus is called our Passover lamb, the one that all the lambs pointed forward to. And he frees us from oppression, to sin, to sin. His deliverance that he gives to us is made possible by our Passover, the cross of Jesus. And it's the same grace that brought these people out of the land that frees those of us in our, from our imprisonment and our labor. God can liberate us from all sorts of things in life can't he? when he brings us to himself. He can take us from an unforgiving spirit. He can move us from being critical and ungrateful. He can take a, a habit that has us in its grips and release us. He can liberate us from being inward looking and being consumed with ourselves to being outward looking towards others. Paul said, God is at work in us. And that's our liberation, our freedom has ongoing right throughout. So God is the God who liberates. Secondly, he's the God who directs. Because the first thing that he does when he brings them out of Egypt, he takes them to Mount Sinai. We believe they may have stayed there for almost a year. Now in Genesis, the only instruction that God had given them to obey him, if you like, was to put the sign of circumcision on 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 the male children. Now God begins to elaborate and outline what's involved in living as his people. They have great privileges, but also great responsibility. And at Sinai, God sets out basic principles of covenant living. He gives them to them. Remember from my teaching days, I taught science, and uh, it was always nice to get the first years in for the first day of their science lesson. And there they were all sitting in front of you, thirsting for knowledge, hopefully, and all with their new uniforms and their wee blazers that were halfway down their hands, remember, so they could get maybe a second year out of it. And they were just lovely to see them all sitting there and uh, uh, starting there. They'd never obviously just come from primary school where they stayed in one room. Now they were going around the school and in a, a science lab for the first time. And the first thing that we did, we didn't let them touch anything. We The first class was always rules of the lab because the lab is essentially a dangerous place to be we wanted to make sure they didn't hurt themselves so we always said okay here are the rules of the lab these are the basic principles of how you operate when you're in this room and God is saying to his people here here is how I want you to live out life in my kingdom and Tells them how they're to react towards him and towards each other. We know them as the Ten Commandments. But he also gives us in the book of Exodus how to apply those principles in practical ways in their relationships with others. How they're to treat their servants. What they're to do when people break the command. 
gave them a pattern for how they were to run their community. He also outlines how they're to be merciful to the poor and the stranger. Because as a society and a community, they were to reflect God's own heart. Because you see, ethics and morality have their origin in God himself. They come from him. That's where we get them from. They're revealed in Exodus as God sets out what he expects from his people. Now, I want to suggest to you that three and a half thousand years later, that's when this took place, almost three and a half thousand years, these are still contemporary. These are still a, a, a blueprint for life in the 21st century. Now, they've been expanded and applied in the New Testament by Christ, by his apostles. But essentially, God said to the people, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's what I meant about bringing them out, not just geographically, but for their hearts. That's what he said he wanted to do. That was their first principle. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was why God had freed them. And that was their responsibility. And that still applies today. When God delivers us into his kingdom, he expects us to show our love to him by our faithfulness to him. He gives us promises, but he also gives us gospel directions that we're to follow. If we claim we're delivered, then the evidence is that we give our loyalty first and foremost to him. We embrace his command, not out of duty, not begrudgingly, but because we love the gift and we cherish it the things that he wants to do. He expects us to be good citizens, doesn't he, and good neighbors who justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Not always successfully, I'm sure you would admit in our own lives, trust that it is our heart's desire to apply those principles to life the ones that God gives us, to the best of our ability, or the degree of faithfulness, not always consistent, but I trust that that's your goal. One, more than anything, that's your daily goal. Allow God to direct you. So the God who liberates, and the God who directs, and lastly, the God who requires. And our time is going quickly, so I'm just going to really mention these. There are three things. I want to mention them very, very briefly. Because there's something very strange about this book. When you look at it, God gives all these instructions about a tent. And it's very, it's very particular. It's the size and shape and material it's to be made out of. How it's to be arranged and who's to serve in it. And who can be a priest. And what preparation do they have to go through before they can serve in the, in the, in the tent. And it had to be followed down to the last detail. And Moses then had to inspect it to make sure it had been done exactly as God had said. Why was it so important? Well, I think there are, there are three reasons. Just mentioned. First of all, because it's about worship. The people had to worship God as he instructed them to worship. He was their God, but he wasn't their body. And he said they had to approach him in a certain way. And Give them instruction about it. Now, all of those are fulfilled in Jesus. So we don't need to go to a tent. He pitched his tent. Jesus, it says, pitched his tent. That's what the Bible says when it means when it says he dwelt among us. That's the term it used. He pitched. He is our priest. He's our offering. He's the one who washes us. And God calls us to come and worship him by the Holy Spirit. Much simpler in the New Testament. Worship in spirit and come in reverence and awe and humility. Praise him. That's what we, we were created to do. And it's a privilege, isn't it? No greater privilege than to worship. So it's about worship. Second thing, it's about focus. Because the interesting thing is that all of the, all of the tents, that's the people living around. That's the big tent in the middle where they worship God. And all the other tents were around, all pointing towards the tabernacle. The 
about focus. They were all to be directed towards you. The symbol of God was there. And they were all to be pointed towards you. A little bit like, I don't know if you ever did the Duke of Edinburgh Award. And part of it was navigation or orienteering. Now, we're spoiled with all the sat-navs now, aren't we? You just look at this and go, well, you know where we are, it tells you. But when you did it, or I think probably you still have to use the, the compass. And, of course, the needle of the compass always points north. That's how we can use it. So this is really a demonstration of the lives of these people pointing towards God. And for us, the needle of our lives is always to point towards him, isn't it? That's, that's the focus of our life, as it was the focus of Jesus. Paul said, for me to live, Christ. And then lastly, about guidance. Because there was always either a cloud or a fire in front of the people, over the tent. And they followed it. If the cloud moved, the cloud during the day and the fire at night, if the cloud moved, they moved. If it was at night and the fire moved, they moved. So God was guiding them, telling them where they were to go and when they were to go. God gives us direction, doesn't he? But again, it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our model. We strive to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be changed into his likeness, to be conformed into his image. We let him be our pattern. Let his example be that we aspire to and long for more than anything. So, time is gone. Let me finish where I started. From Exodus or Hebrews chapter. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The author of our faith. That will occupy us for a life. We'll never lose our way. As God led the people to the land of promise. Lead us. Father, we thank you that you do not change, that you're always the same, that as you showed yourself to be in Jesus Christ, so you are right throughout the scripture. We pray, Lord, that we will be able to apply all of those things that you have given to us in your word to our life. Thank you that you are the God who liberates us, that you are the God who also in your mercy, direct us, and also that you show us what you require. Help us, Lord, by your power to be such people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, finish our our service this morning with a uh, closing, uh, closing hymn, which will come up for us.
mercy and peace from God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us now and always. And to your name be the praise, honor, and the glory, this day and forevermore. Amen.